big leap in 1998. In March, I launched the world's first full-color feng shui magazine. Feng Sushi is very much a play on word. We wanted to have a fun name, incorporating something very fashionable and new, like a spring sway. Suddenly you get opportunities, you know, you get an improvement in your job, you get a new job offer. If you freelance, the work will come, the fees will be higher, the people you're meeting with will be more important. And it's just really surprising. Thanks for joining us. I'm Karen Clare. Many people help bring feng shui to the Western world. Explaining something new for the very first time is never easy. Where do you start? We have a very special FSL one-on-one -on -one with Stephen Skinner. Back in 1976, I was in Hong Kong, and I had a friend who was a Chinese barrister out there, and he. Uh, he uh, had his offices and the business wasn't too good, so I jokingly said, why don't you call a feng shui man in? It was a bit of a joke. And he eventually did. And the feng shui man said, ah, oh, move this here, move that. You sit in the small office, put your secretary in the big office. And after a bit of resistance, he actually did that. And lo and behold, 10 days later, he got invited to be a junior counsel on a, a big case out there. And ever since he's moved his practice, he's had the same feng shui man in. And he's got bigger and bigger and bigger and finally he's retired and he's well off. So I thought, well, there might be something in this. It was only in the 80s I suddenly realized that it was beginning to be a fashionable topic of um, conversation at dinner parties. So uh, I thought, God, never thought this would become popular again. So I'd switched careers and I was a magazine publisher anyway. So I took the big leap and in 1998, in March, I launched the world's first full color feng shui magazine. And everybody in publishing said, you're mad. Nobody knows what it is, far less uh, whether it'll work. And uh, we, we, sold, uh, we sold out on the first issue. In fact, we had to reprint and we sold um, more than 120,000 copies. And uh, everybody went mad and thought, God, this, was, this, this really is something. And we got interest even from China. And uh, so we had somebody um, offer to do a Chinese edition. So for 20 issues, we actually sold the same material back to the Chinese, which is like taking coals back to Newcastle. Um, and there it outsold all the local magazines on feng shui, so we'd obviously added something to it. And so for three years it was remarkably successful and it brought the interest in feng shui from almost a, a new age thing right into a style and design subject that you know, everybody could be interested in, a, a respectable subject. I would have never have thought at this period that feng shui could have become nearly as popular. And when I look back, I think, well, it's a little bit like all sorts of aspects of Chinese culture. The Chinese are very jealous for that traditional knowledge, and it takes thousands of years for information to come across. You know, starting a thousand years back, gunpowder made it to the West long after the Chinese invented it, and rice and chopsticks and paper and printing. They were printing things while um, our ancestors were writing on the skins of animals. Um, and so in the 20th century, um, acupuncture came across from China closely guarded secret and now it's accepted as something that is medically sound and works for some conditions. Kung Fu came across and people like Bruce Lee um, really pushed it into the, the Western community. And uh, now Feng Shui has been with us for, well, I suppose I've been involved for 28 years. And it's become accepted and it's integral with a lot of architectural work, it's integral with a lot of design work. Um, it's, um, it's mainstream. I've written um, five books on feng shui now, which have been published, um, with another two in the pipeline, uh, starting from the scholarly one in 1976, which started the whole ball rolling, right up to the Dolan Kindersley Kiss Guide to Feng Shui, which is my most recent one. Design went through a minimalist phase. phase. Uh, minimalism isn't really the same as feng shui. Feng shui is concerned with placing things in the, the most opportune places to help the, the chi flow and the energy. Um, it's also about making a living space um, tolerable, so you're not bumping into things, being cut by sharp edges and things like that. So that generally living in a feng shui space is a lot less stressful. Launching something that's close to your heart means that you can make uh, mistakes of perception and, and marketing judgment. 
but um, it worked and the thing did so much better than we ever thought. Uh, in fact, I was nominated for Publisher of the Year for the magazine, which is like a, a UK um, publisher's Oscars equivalent. So that gave me rather a warm feeling. Feng Shui became popular in the UK um, probably before it really took off in the States. Um, I suppose the early 80s. Um, even before that, in 79, 80, I was lecturing on Feng Shui in Austria, which is where it really became most popular soonest. Um, and in the States, there's a sort of a variety of Feng Shui, black hat Feng Shui, which spread early on, and it's only now that people who are interested in that are learning the traditional Chinese uh, kosher Feng Shui. Thomas Lin Yong has done Feng Shui a great service because he's made so many people interested in it conceptually, and now all of those people are picking up on traditional techniques, they're learning how to use a low pan, they're learning how to actually use the directions, the magnetic field, and the chi flows, rather than the sort of simplistic uh, form that they learned before. You'll hear more from Stephen later in the show. Now let's just jump to the FSL question. What affects the nature of chi in the home? What the house is made of? The physical forms outside of the home? The pathways and walls inside of the house? Or both, what's inside and out? Stacy will have the answer for you at the end of the show. And if you'd like to know more information about episodes you may have missed, visit us at www.fengshuilife.tv. I'll say there's good chi in this, this business. There's good chi amongst the staff and uh, with the customers. And uh, I mean, it's a very sort of attractive place to come. Asian fusion is a blending of many different Eastern ways. So if you like Feng Shui and you love sushi, then you're going to dig our next story. The Feng Sushi we are at in the moment is uh, located in London Bridge down by the Bar Market and is the second out of three branches. We also have one in uh, Fulham and one in Chelsea. Um, and we are doing um, sushi, therefore the name Feng Sushi, and we're specializing in a European interpretation of Japanese food. Feng Sushi is very much a play on word. We wanted to have a fun name, incorporating something very fashionable and new, like as Feng Shui, but also sort of as a play on word. And we thought Feng Sushi sounded really good. So it's, it's very much a combination of, of Feng Shui in the sense of something, a new way of looking at life, a new way of, of incorporating attitudes to work and, and to food and to interior and then sushi. Um, it's not meant to be taken too seriously. It it's sort of has a, a bit of an irony in it as well. We wanted to create a, a, a restaurant that wasn't too much fine dining, a place where people can come and enjoy good f food at reasonable prices, but also create a space, an open space, that felt like you were almost outside even though the weather condition so what we've done down here in London Bridge is almost building a garden inside with, with features of stones and fish tanks and um, bamboos, lots of wood. And also the wood we use for our tabletops and the stones is, is from a very good friend who's involved in the company. Who's, so we sort of try to have family relation as well. So things has a bit of a history, um, which we think gives the place a bit more so. Also we try to, to light, light the place at different times of day. So in the daytime, it, it's sort of like bright and lunch trade and that we sort of dim the lights and we have fireplaces and candles and make it a bit more uh, exotic. The people who come to Feng Sushi is all kinds of people. People who are keen sushi eater, who know exactly what they want. People who's curious, who want to start getting into this food because it's very much a quiet taste. And we cater for a, a more European market, so we have all the traditional things, but we also have lots of things in the menu that's 
bit more safe and, 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 and reminding of, of what you would eat in, in European cuisine. This branch of Feng Sushi is in London Bridge, which is a, a very, very fascinating area. It's like very much old London. You've got all the old uh, pubs and listed buildings. And right next to, next to us, we have a, a major refurbishment called Vinopolis, which has the tunnels and the bridges and what you sort of relate to when you think of old London. And it's, and it's lovely to be down here because there's a real market uh, atmosphere and lots of small businesses developing themselves and uh, there's lots of organic produce coming out from the countryside into the market and, and it's a very sort of healthy organic area to be in. What attracted us to this site is that we have the light coming in from, from different angles to the building and the building has different, it has no sort of sharp corners and sharp squares, so we can have, create sort of a good atmosphere, um, a good flow inside. I love the back of the building because we have the, the skylight coming in through our rear window, and that window carries through into the, uh, to the kitchen, and it's just so pleasant as a chef actually having daylight, which is, is uh, sometimes rare. And you can follow the seasons and hear the, the rain and see the sun, and it's just lovely. We, we've done the front, so you just open up shutters, and then it's just one open space. And for winter time, what we've done is we have these plastic curtains to keep in the heat. So we always open to the street, we're always approachable. And that's a very important thing about things. Sushi is it's nothing too snobby or too fancy, it's, it's, just, it's just there and everyone can use it. It's very important for us, and it's very important, I think, for good energy, for, for good attitude to be, to be open like that. I say there's good chi in this, this business, there's good chi amongst the staff and uh, with the customers and uh, I mean it's a very sort of attractive place to come. I think we, we're facing the right way, we meant to face the way where the money should be brought into the business and it is all going very well. Uh, the only problem with in the Feng Shui way is that uh, we have the toilet beneath our entrance, but it doesn't seem to affect us. My job at Feng Sushi is being the executive chef, uh, so I'm in, in charge of the kitchen and the menu. I personally think the reason why sushi is gaining so much popularity is because it is a very balanced food. It is a very yin-yang food. It's, it's a sort of equal measure of carbohydrates and protein and then just that little good of fat you need and people seem to turn to sushi now they're more health conscious. I think Feng Shui is, is a very interesting uh, theory and I think it's I think it's difficult to follow it uh, very uh, dogmatically but it's, it's definitely it's definitely this, this, it makes sense, um, but I think you see it in lots of other things as well, uh, like lots of functionalism or habit, sort of try to interpret that as well. Um, so I would say the way our interpretation of things way is, is, is sort of a mild one. For me, the, what's important for, for people who come to Feng Sushi, the experience that's important for me to have is that they get a good casual service, they get a good quali uh, high quality product, fast and easy, uh, not too expensive. And we can also even deliver it to the door if they need to. We do a lot of deliveries out of the house. And what our attitude is the food you come here and eat is the same as the, the stuff you have delivered to your door. And we don't want to be too snobby, but we want to give great value, great atmosphere. Nice music, nice people, very straightforward. Good thing to know. Feng Sushi has locations all over England. Now, don't forget to check out our website at www.fengshuilife.tv. And while you're there, check out our archived FSL questions section. Now, while we're on the subject, let's review the FSL question. What affects the chi inside the home? Is it? what the home's made of, the physical forms outside the home, 
the pathways and walls inside the home, or is it both? What's inside and out? We'll have the answer to that question at the end of the show. You can help your love life with feng shui, there's no question about that, because what is, what is love life? Love life is your relationship with other people. If you go around with a spring in your step and a light in your eye, the people that you bump into are going to be A, attracted, and B, communicate with you, resulting probably in relationships, affairs, whatever. Um, if you go around with uh, dull eyes and uh, no life, no chi, no energy, then it's going to be a damn side harder. Welcome back. Now it's time for part two of our FSL one-on-one -on -one with Stephen Skinner. The Chinese words just mean wind and water, which doesn't tell you anything. Um, what it really is, it's the management of qi energy. Um, and for qi energy, it means that thing which, which helps your health, your confidence, all these sorts of, of good personal qualities. Uh, if you manage it so it comes into your house and accumulates there, then you're practicing good feng shui. If you dissipate it, blow it away, or don't even encourage it to come through the front door, then you're doing bad feng shui. So I would just say in two words, it's qi energy management. Qi is rather elusive, but it's a lot more concrete than, say, radio waves. I mean, in the 21st century, we think about radio waves, we take it for granted. We talk about uh, mobile phones, we take it for granted. Nobody's ever seen those waves. Well, Qi is something that the Chinese have taken for granted for 4,000 years. And they know perfectly well that if you're in a house which is deficient in Qi, you'll not only be able to feel it, but you'll be able to see it. And the, the results of the, the people living there are not going to be very healthy. They're not going to achieve and so forth. Whereas a house which has got adequate stores of qi, the people just seem to do better and get luckier, uh, which is an odd concept in the West. But um, uh, I believe that there's even a Japanese company now who's come out with an instrument which purports to measure qi. And I think it's actually just a matter of time before somebody really does that in a provable way. Well, I think some of the people who attempt to practice feng shui without even using a, a compass to find out where the directions are it is a bit of a peeve. And people who feel they can just do it intuitively, somebody who's spent years mastering the subject can then perhaps intuit some of the answers. But you quite often get beginners who feel they've got a feeling. And quite often feng shui isn't about feelings. Sometimes the prescription is to do something which doesn't feel necessarily good. But if it's the correct thing, then it will make the change which is necessary. If you're hiring a feng shui master in the East, it's easy because local reputations are well known and simply by asking around you can find out who's done good jobs or who have clients who are successful. I mean, after all, if their clients are not happy, healthy, wealthy and whatever, then they're obviously not doing a good job. Um, in the West, it's a little bit more difficult because that kind of information is not so easy to go by. So you can ask what clients they've had before. Uh, you can also ask what style of feng shui they use. Um, frankly, any feng shui master who doesn't use a low pan, a Chinese feng shui compass, and who doesn't ask birth date information about the occupants, uh, and who doesn't actually come to the site and look around the house, th th they're the sort of practitioners you don't want to have. If a good feng shui practitioner can improve your conditions in your life, a bad feng shui practitioner can actually destroy them. I mean, if feng shui was nonsense, then it wouldn't matter. But feng shui is not nonsense, it's deadly serious. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't have a herbalist prescribe um, belladonna or deadly nightshade and, and think that was just as good as the herbalist who prescribed uh, a very useful herb. Uh, so yes, bad feng shui can definitely um, damage your luck. You can help your love life with feng shui, there's no question about that, because what is, what is love life? Love life is your relationship with other people. If you go around with a spring in your step and a light in your eye, the people that you bump into are going to be A, attracted, 
and B, communicate with you, resulting probably in relationships, affairs, whatever. Um, if you go around with uh, dull eyes and uh, no life, no chi, no energy, then it's going to be a damn sight harder. In the East, um, some of the richest and the, the very rich tycoons not just have a feng shui master in once a year, they have them on retainer, so that every time there's a new project, they bring them in to make sure the new project starts properly. These guys are seriously rich, stay seriously rich, and pay quite large feng shui fees to, to insure it. Um, over here, same thing applies. If you get uh, you know, the wealth chi flowing properly, then opportunities will open. Nobody, no, you won't win the lottery, because that's luck. That's, that's a mathematical chance. Nobody can change the mathematics. But suddenly you get opportunities. You know, you'll get an improvement in your job. You get a new job offer. If you freelance, the work will come in. The fees will be higher. The people you're meeting with will be more important. And it's just really surprising. It's the degree of your energy which affects your health. Obviously, individual conditions, like if you have an infection, then reach for the antibiotics, go and see your doctor. But if your energy flow is good and you're, you're strong internally, which you can improve from feng shui, then you're less likely to, to fall sick from other things and you're more likely to recover from things which otherwise might have brought you down. The first wave of feng shui's um, advent in the West has come and gone. Um, Always with any new thing coming in, there's a lot of froth and bubble the first time around, and then it settles down and people get really into it and do it properly. And that's what we're beginning to see now. People are taking not just a weekend course, which is not adequate. They're taking long courses, investing time and money into learning the right techniques. Uh, and I think that will build over the next four or five years. And whenever I'm asked this question, I draw the parallel with Kung Fu or acupuncture, who came in in the 60s and the 70s, took about 20 years to become respectable, and then settle down for the long haul. And now it's become as much a part of our culture as, as eating rice is, or as using paper and print, um, all Chinese, good Chinese inventions, or indeed using gunpowder, a nice destructive Chinese invention. Um, so I think solid growth for the next four or five years, um, and then a flowering in the areas of feng, shui, of, um, feng shui application in architecture and design. And we'll begin to see more and more buildings built um, which are appealing and feel good as well as uh, just attractive. Okay, now it's time. Do you remember our FSL question? What factors affect the nature of chi in the home? Is it what the home is made of? The physical forms outside the home? The pathways and walls inside the home? Or both, what's inside and out? Well, I won't keep you waiting. It's both what's inside and outside the home that affect the nature of chi. The trick is to distinguish exactly what those effects are. And that's our goal here on the show, is to help you understand that. See, learning feng shui isn't easy. It doesn't matter how you get there, just as long as you get there. See you next time. refer to your manual.